I'm Shahar Azani, and welcome to this very special episode of Eye on Israel. Joining Israel's defense forces is an obligation. It's truly a privilege of every Israeli at the age of 18. It is then, after graduating high school, that Israelis bid farewell to their families and they start their journey to adulthood in the service of the State of Israel for a period of two to three years and beyond, much beyond. In the Israeli context, a knock at the door refers to a moment feared by all and experienced by all too many families. It is when that knock is heard, sometimes in the dead of night, and at the door you find IDF officers who are coming to break the worst of all news. Appropriately, it is also the name of Israeli author Ori Slonim's book detailing his incredible history of secretly working with Israel's MIAs and POWs over the years. It is one of the most sacred missions in Israel, being the very foundation of the Jewish state's relations with its soldiers and their families. A few words of introduction about our truly esteemed guest. Ori Slonim was born in 1942 in Israel, six years before the re-establishment of the Jewish state. Ori comes from a seventh generation, get this, seventh family that had lived in Hebron. He grew up in the Tel Aviv area and became a successful private lawyer. Prior to college and law school, he had entered the Israel Defense Forces and became a paratrooper and was promoted to major as a parachuting instructor. He married his sweetheart Tammy and began practicing law in 1970. In 1974, he and Tammy were injured in a deadly terrorist attack in a Tel Aviv cinema theater when a bomb planted by a terrorist was detonated. In 1986, Israel's President Chaim Herzog, who was well acquainted with Ori, came up with the idea of appointing Ori a special counsel to the defense minister for issues of POW and MIAs. One who would become from the civilian world. Concentrating first and foremost on relations with the families, this position was held by Uri for one Israeli shekel a year, an American quarter. In 2006, 20 years later, Uri turned over the baton to others to fulfill the same mission. Uri, thank you so much for joining us on JBS. It is such a pleasure having you with us. It is my pleasure and honor. Thank you. You know, um, when I read the book, um, you are talking about a, uh, you're describing a talk you gave at your granddaughter's elementary school, Naama. And you are t talking about how the speaking engagement was one of the most exciting and important in your life. Please share with us a little bit about that incident, because I think of you as this powerful attorney, one of the pillars of society in Israel, heading variety, doing so much more, and here you are at elementary school. Uh, it, was, uh, it was quite funny. My granddaughter, Nama uh, asked me to come and uh, uh, to, to have a conversation or speech, whatever, with, uh, with her uh, classmates. And at that time, they were very young, and I never spoke uh, in front of such such young people. You know, I don't know, uh, I don't remember the language even. Right. And uh, they asked me about my life, about uh, many episodes in my life. And, um, you know, for, for example, they asked me, uh, how did you meet your wife? Uh, how did you become a sailor? How, uh, how you became a special counselor to the defense minister. Right. And I didn't uh, pay enough attention to my, my answers, which was, um, I believe in total, I said by accident. Right. Because I said, you know, you know, it was by accident. And, you know, I, I tried to be very, very childish, but it was the truth. And then uh, after a while, one of the, one of her uh, for her classmates, uh, boyfriend, boyfriend asked me, look, you are quite a famous lawyer, quite a famous man, quite a big shot. How come that everything in your life came by accident? Yeah. Uh, you know, it was it was like a joke, but uh, you know, it's life. It's life, and uh, I think that the whole the whole issue is to make out of uh, something which is uh, which is unpredictable to make it the, one of the most important issue in your life. So this would happen to me in many many occasions in my life, and this is the. 
The short, the short answer to your, uh, to your first question. You know, I, I just imagine myself, you know, you're standing there with those kids and you coming to them with your vast experience. These children will end up being IDF soldiers at some point and will join that family. And you can see all the way through that tunnel. I can only imagine what was going through your mind when you were speaking with them. Yeah, of course, of course. But, uh, but mainly it was the gap of, uh, the gap of ages. You know, you're, you're coming to such uh, such such youngsters, and uh, right. you know, it's, it's it's all right, but uh, their life is something different than your life. All right, for sure, and I'm sure they've taken a lot from the conversation with you. I uh, want to pause before we enter into uh, the realm of the book. I want to touch a little bit about the preamble and talk a little bit about the Slonim family in Hebron. I understand that you almost didn't come to be that uh, had something happened in Hebron at a certain point, you wouldn't be sitting with us today. Tell us a little bit about that. Uh, my, family, my family came to Hebron uh, uh, in uh, 1835, mm -hmm. something like that. They, they were a Hasidic family, and uh, they came by, uh, by the order of uh, the head of Chabad, Reb Shneo Zalma Meladi, Baal Atania. And uh, they settled in Hebron uh, for, for many, many generations. Uh, my grandfather, the father of my father, uh, he, uh, uh, he was uh, the head of uh, Bank Leumi in Hebron. Mm -hmm. uh, at that time, uh, the, the name of this bank was Anglo-Palestine Corporation, yeah. APAC. Right. And, uh, but he, he has to leave his uh, role a couple of years before, before uh, 1929, before the riots, because he, uh, he was asked to, um, to found another branch in Jerusalem. And uh, the one who replaced him was also one of the family, Eliezer Dan Slonim. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was the first one in the riots after a couple of years who, who was slaughtered there. You know, they came first to the head of the bank. I don't know why, but uh, you can imagine. Right. And uh, I, always, I, I always thought about uh, this thing, but mainly... The Eliezer Dan Sloan, the one who was uh, killed by assassinated by by uh, these uh, riots, uh, he was the brother of uh, Rivka Burg. She is the mother of our uh, um, ex Speaker of Knesset, Avram right. Burg. Right. And when I uh, when I when I uh, was invited to light a torture in Yom Ha'atzmaut in Independence Day, he was the host as the the Speaker of the Knesset, and he said, "You know that." Uh, you are living. Uh, you are living by chance. <laughs> your, life, your life could be something else, or even you, you, you wouldn't be born. Right. But uh, this was something which you know I, um, I heard from my grandfather many, many times because I was raised by my parents, but uh, I, I lived with my grandfather for many, many years uh, as as his grand uh, grandchild, and it was a great chance of my life. Wow, you know the the story of. Um of Eliezer Dan Slonim, who wasn't just murdered by the rioters, he also harbor, harbored a lot of people at his home, you know, trying to rescue them, who many of them fell in the hands of these rioters. So I am so happy that you are here, and not just I'm happy, but there are so many other people, so many who benefit, still benefit and benefited from your public work and personal work. So I'd love to dive into that realm for a minute and ask you, by chance, how did you come to find yourself in a position where you are interacting with families of prisoners of war and those missing in action in Israel? How did it come to be? As, as I told the kids, by chance. By chance, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, no, no, it was not by chance. I believe that it's something from above, something from above. Um, it was 1986. At that time, uh, I was uh, at the... I believe it. After 15 years of being, uh, if not, if, if to be to be uh, uh, to be uh, honest, I was quite a famous lawyer at that time. Right. And uh, I knew Mr. Herzog. Uh, at that time, he was uh, in between his being an ambassador of the United Nations and being the president of Israel. And he was a lawyer for a couple of, I believe, for a year or something like that. And uh, we we appeared together in an arbitration in Tel Aviv. So it, it happens that, uh, that he met me and uh, we, we became uh, friends even uh, at the gap of uh, our ages. And uh, he approached me afterwards, after a couple of months, and um, asked me if I would like to volunteer for one year only to, uh, 
just to, to assist the families of the missing in action and prisoners of war of Israel together with the IDF uh, people. And uh, he said, look, before you, uh, the, 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 there was a member of Knesset, uh, Shmuel Tamir, mm-hmm. and he died after a year. And then he said, uh, then we, we nominated Mr. Arya Morinsky, lawyer. He served one year and he died. He said, hey, no. I, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I love my life. And he right. said, okay, come, come for a year. And uh, I, uh, I came for a year and stayed for 34 years. Wow. And because this mission, uh, I, I believe that, uh, that this mission is one of the most sacred missions in humans uh, being life. I also know that uh, according to Jewish tradition, the, the uh, freeing of uh, prisoners of war is one of the highest uh, mitzvah. Uh, right. mitzvot. And uh, you know, within the year, I understood why. So it happened, to, it happened that I, I came into this for a year and stayed for so many years. And uh, after a very short time, uh, Mr. the late uh, Itzhak Rabin, our Prime Minister and Defense Minister at that, at that time, right. um, asked me to, to get a title. And the title was not for, for honor or not for any, uh, you know, being important, but only for the, for the ability to, to work with others uh, with some authority. Right. When you are coming on behalf of the prime minister. It's it's, it's quite an authority, right. and then I started the whole thing, which uh, which uh, was was part was the initial part, and uh, I, I can I cannot say that it was the majority of my time, but it was a, a great part of my time within the years, and a great part of who you are as a person, bringing your skills from the legal world, and to be honest, uh, deciding to renounce a big chunk of. Uh, of uh, revenue and dedicate a lot of time and effort and a lot of heart for uh, this issue and also for the plight of the families. We're going to touch upon that a bit later. I just have a small anecdotal question for you. Your um, beautiful history, you know, rooted in Zionism from Hebron and beyond, how did that fact play a part in your discussions, conversations, and negotiations with some of what we must admit are the nastiest people on earth. You know, these are the, the terrorists of terrorists. Did they relate to the fact that you're, you know, a Hebron original family, seventh generation, have been around for a while? Did it ever come up in your conversations, negotiations with them? Uh, first of all, I believe uh, I believe that uh, my, my aim was, uh, my target, my aim was only one to do everything uh, we can. And it was not only myself, it was uh, with many, many hundreds and even thousands of uh, friends and and uh, partners, you know, from, from the IDF, from Mossad, Shabak, and all these uh, agencies. And uh, and uh, my only mission was to to, uh, to get the gold, you know, to, to free, to, to, to know the whereabouts, to stop the uncertainty of the families. Right. And uh, I, I didn't pay so much attention to the personality of those uh, whom I met. For, for, for me, they were uh, partners, um, uh, even if they were, uh, you know, bad people or uh, how do you say, uh, nasty or whatever, or uh, uh, not, 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 not the positive kind of right. human being. But for me, it was uh, not, an, not an issue. Because for me, they were partners for negotiation to, to uh, achieve the mission. So uh, the fact that I was not, uh, that I'm not, uh, you know, a newcomer, I'm not, uh, I'm not a Ole Hadash, I'm, I'm here for uh, approximately 200 years, not me, but my family. And uh, when somebody is considering uh, uh, Eretz Israel as, as, a, as a land of, uh, of, all, of all, I'm one of them. Right. So, you know, sometimes we, we were kidding among ourselves that I am Palestinian and right. stuff like that. <laughs> but I, I never I never considered those whom I met as as you uh, as you described them as the nastiest uh, human being because uh, you know when, when you consider it uh, it's your body language and uh, I was I was without it without you, it because you were very focused on the goal only only focused on the goal and even even I knew their backgrounds and I knew their uh, their past. Uh, I I put all this aside, and you know you know uh, as a human being, but especially as a lawyer, 
you know how to differ between your uh, personal emotions and personal feelings right. and the facts and, and the truth. And it's, it's all right. I, you know, uh, not everybody can understand it. No, no, I, I completely understand. And especially when you are upholding such a, such a sacred mission. So I want to I wanna give our viewers an example that you detail in your fabulous book. And that example pertains to Kurt Waldheim, um, the Austrian president at the time. Tell, yeah. tell, share with our viewers the story of your uh, idea to reach out to Mr. Wildheim and what was uh, the late Prime Minister Rabin's reaction and what happened. Uh, Kurt Waldheim, uh, he was the Austrian ambassador to the United Nations and afterwards he became the president of Austria. And uh, it, uh, it's, uh, it was not a secret at, the, at, a, certain star, at a certain day that uh, he had a, big, a Nazi background. And uh, he, uh, he was, uh, uh, in person, he was a friend of, uh, of the Iranian leadership at that time, of, uh, of the president of uh, Iran, Raf Sanjani. Right. And uh, I believe that they had some, some formal connections uh, in the United Nations, whatever. And uh, we heard that he's, uh, he's going to visit, when he was president of uh, Austria, we heard that uh, he's going to visit uh, the Iranian president, and uh, we always thought that Iran has uh, has the information uh, even more. But uh, Iran was uh, was an, an address for for information and even for more than that. And um, I, I came to uh, to Mr. Rabin at that time, and I said, uh, I think we have to meet him. I, I, I'll go to meet him. And uh, the first reaction the first reaction was. You are not going to meet him. The state of Israel is not uh, recognizing him. We have no con no relations, no connections with him. He was a Nazi, and you know, no nothing. I said, look, I think that uh, for me, as a as a person who is dealing with these matters, and I am a civilian, I am not a civil servant. Uh, even I got, uh, I had to get uh, my one shekel a year, which I didn't get until today. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, I, I was a civilian. It was my uh, my 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 right to go in the, on behalf of the families. And uh, I told him, "Look, I would like to go." He said, you, "You're not going because you're not allowed to go." I said, "Look, so I will uh, quit, and I go as a as a personal uh, personal lawyer, as uh, family friends, whatever." And I, you know, I, it was in in in, in good uh, you know in good spirit right. and, and in lots of uh, lots of uh, 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 understanding that I would go to the to the devil, I would go to the devil to find the whereabouts of our prisoners of war missing in action because this is this is the mission. If you are starting, to, you know, to 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 find some ways how to not to meet somebody because he's so and so, no. I would I would go to anybody. Right. I met I met terrorists. I met mafia people. I met uh, uh, people who are so negative in the background. I didn't care. I didn't care. I'm not the judge. And uh, so he, he told me, "Look, um, if you want to go," I said, "I'm going." I take I take a, a letter from the families, and I will go. And if you want, uh, I will uh, I will give back my title. Whatever he said, law. Okay. Uh, on behalf of the state of Israel, you are not going. If you want to go on behalf of the families, do it. And uh, at that time, he told me that uh, if it will be out, uh, he will uh, he will declare um, that this was the, the the formula. I'm not a civil servant. And then I took a letter from took some letters from the families. All the families, every family wrote a letter because I'm going to one was going to meet uh, 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 the president of Iran, and. Uh, <clears throat> And uh, I went. Uh, I also got a letter from the from the same president Herzog, who knew Waldheim from the same United Nations. Oh, wow. uh, there, were, there were two ambassadors there. Right. And I went to I went to Austria to court Waldheim. And at first, I went on my uh, my my account. I paid for it because the government didn't want to be uh, involved. And uh, I met him in his uh, in his palace in in Vienna. And uh, it was quite a, a, an uneasy meeting, uh, not because, not only because he was a, a Nazi, a, a Nazi background, but because I had to choose the the my, my verbal behavior. 
because I, I'm not coming to forgive him. I'm not coming to give him any, any price for, for, for anything. But the only thing which I could tell him is that uh, our uh, main mission is to have the whereabouts or to bring them back. And I told him anyone in the world, I don't care who we will be, uh, who will uh, assist us to do it, uh, will have some, not credit, but something for himself, not from us. And it was, uh, I was playing with words, playing with words. Right. And he, uh, it was okay. He went to, uh, he went to uh, Iran and he met uh, Raf Sajani, but uh, the, the end of uh, the whole uh, issue was the Raf Sajani denied everything like it happens from time to time. Right. And, uh, but the families felt, first of all, they felt that uh, I, was, uh, I was strict with the mission. And uh, I felt that uh, I, um, I did what I had to do. And uh, I, I keep on my relations with, uh, with Mr. Rabin and, and everybody. But uh, it was quite a, a, quite a very strange meeting. Right. It's very telling that there is nothing that you would not do to um, uphold your mission of standing by these families and bringing back their loved ones. And this is truly, truly admirable. Um, I, I want to, you know, when a lot of people think about POWs and MIAs, they think about Israel and the Jews. And I want to talk to you uh, a little bit about the interesting case of Samir Assad of blessed memory, um, the IDF soldier of Druze origin. Um, which happened, I believe, you know, in 1983, um, who disappeared. Tell us a little bit about what was the story, what happened, and what did you do, and this spe special connection with the Druze family. Uh, Samir Assad, Samir Assad uh, he, he was the uh, uh, son of uh, one of the uh, most distinguished families in Bejan, in the Israeli Galilee, a Druze family. Uh, and uh, he was uh, he was a soldier at the 80s, not the 90s, the 80s in the 80s. in, uh, in uh, South Lebanon. Right. And uh, uh, he was uh, he was kidnapped by by terrorists in Lebanon by uh, by uh, uh, sending some some uh, nice lady to him to you know some Druze lady from from uh, and, uh, and at the time at the time Ori there were actually Lebanese crossing back and forth between Lebanon yeah, yeah, and yeah. Israel yeah we met we met Lebanese every day at that, right. at that time and uh, they kidnapped him it was uh, before I start before I started my role it was in the 80s right and uh, then he was in uh, he was in the captivity uh, something like uh, two years and no no negotiations because nobody wanted to to negotiate at that time uh, one day the Israeli Air Force bombed some some uh, some target in Lebanon and all of a sudden after this bombing uh, the whole media was with the headlines the Israeli Air Force killed the Israeli prisoners of war prisoner of war as Samir Assad uh, they, they they blamed Israel that they killed him and uh, did the family was, know did the family know that Assad was kidnapped yes they know everything they knew they knew, okay. they knew everything everything uh, first of all the, the day that he was uh, disappearing uh, the IDF people uh, uh, were, were in connections uh, the, the the great the great, uh, uh, the great uh, uh, officers who are dealing with the families, which is a tough, tough mission, uh, they are in connection with the family from day one on, on all prisoners of war. Right. And uh, and uh, it was it was a big uh, it was a big mess of uh, you know of media, you know the state of Israel killed its right. prisoners right. in prison of war. He was Druze. They didn't care about him because he's Jews, you know, he's second right. degree. Yeah. Many, 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 many such uh, awful uh, uh, blaming. And uh, when I came to my role in uh, 86, uh, we started the negotiation. Uh, we knew that he's uh, dead uh, because he stopped appearing on TV. Before that, he, he appeared on TV and said, uh, and said the things against the state of Israel, whatever they uh, they dictated him to say. And uh, we started negotiate negotiating when we knew that he is dead, with uh, with the Democratic Front of Neif Hawatme, 
right? And in these negotiations, I took part with uh, with some good friends uh, of uh, the Israeli IDF intelligence. And at the end of the day, we, we 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 had a deal with them, and the deal was that we are bringing back the body, the remains of uh, Samir Assad, and we are uh, allowing one deportee of this organization to return to the West Bank. This was the whole uh, the whole price. I hate this word price, but this was the whole consideration for that uh, uh, for that uh, which which nowadays when people are are, are commenting. Uh, uh, you know the prices and all this. They they, they forgot this price. Right. And uh, we, after the negotiation, we brought his remains to Israel. But before before we uh, before we went to Austria to identify his uh, remains there and to do the whole uh, the whole deal, his father asked the defense minister at that time, Mr. Arens, that uh, we will before we bring him back when we check his body, his, his bones. He would like to know first if it is really his son and not a false body, whatever. Right. Number two, uh, he would like to know how he was killed and he would like to know who killed him. And, uh, you know, we, we, we took to our, uh, we took to our uh, meeting in, uh, in Vienna. We took some specialists who checked uh, his uh, body and checked every bone and so that no one bone of his body was hurted by a bomb of, uh, of an aircraft. So the, the conclusion was that he was not killed by the Air Force of Israel, which is right. very, very... A big surprise, huh? Yeah, and he was, he, was, he was identified that it is Samir, you know, the teeth and all this uh, kind of uh, identification. And, um, and uh, I asked the, the expert in Vienna, if you can tell me, in what way he was killed. And then what he did, he, he, he counted his bones and he found that one bone is missing, the bone that is, uh, is uh, guarding your heart. Right. He said, look, I'm a, I'm, I'm a specialist for, for this kind of, uh, of, uh, of checking. He was killed by one bullet who hurted only one bone and this bone is missing. So we had the, all, all, the, you know, all the truth and everything when we could, we could come back to Israel and uh, tell the family that uh, that not 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 the Israeli Air Force killed the, the prisoner right. of war. It was an awful an awful blame and things like that. And uh, from that day, uh, I, I Tommy and myself we became members of this family until until these days for many many years. And uh, we are part of the Druze. Uh, you know, there was there was actually an exchange you describe in the book, Ori where the father um, tells you, you know, you brought back my son, but uh, you're missing a bone. Um, yeah. And you acknowledge, and they said, you owe me. That means you yeah. owe me. What? Yeah, it was, it was a very exciting moment when, uh, when Muhammad, uh, the late father of uh, Samir, he died the last year in the age of uh, 90. Oh, wow. uh, he, he, he told the defense minister and myself that uh, if one bone is missing, we owe him something. Right. No, we owe Bejan. And at that day, uh, you cannot imagine, uh, you know, the defense minister asked him, so what do you, what, what would you like to have? And, you know, at that day, Bejan was, you know, without too much electricity, too much water. And we thought he would ask for something, you know, material. And then he said in, in our village, there were 26 uh, casualties in the, in the Israeli wars. And we don't have a military, uh, uh, military cemetery. And they said, we'd like to have Bet Kvarot. And uh, of course, they got one of the, uh, one of the, if you can say about the cemetery, nice, one of the beautiful, most beautiful cemetery and uh, respectable uh, uh, in Israel. And uh, for me, it was a, a great experience, uh, especially because they, you know, the Druze, the Druze uh, family and the Druze, the whole Druze uh, community, uh, you know, they are, they are a bit different in their in their mentality of, uh, uh, of the attitudes to to death and life, and uh, you know they have all the reincarnation, beliefs. reincarnation. But in, in in the case of soldiers, uh, it's it's it doesn't it doesn't apply because wow. they, then they have the body and the they everything is okay. 
You know, that, that just there goes to show you the heart of a nation. Because you, Ori, it doesn't matter if it's a Bedouin, Muslim, Christian, Jewish, as long huh. as they're part of the Israel family and the Israel Defense Forces, you are them for them full force. And so was, I believe, was Minister Arens. I mean, this is a very touching exchange you had there with Muhammad of blessed memory. Um, for sure, I agree. You know, when the issue of Israeli POWs and MIAs come to mind, it, it's almost synonymous with uh, the name Ron Arad. Share with us a little bit about your experience with the Arad family and maybe a few words about your personal connection with his late mother, uh, Batya Arad, of blessed memory. Uh, Ron, Arad, uh, Ron Arad was, uh, uh, was captured in, the, in, the, in this October 16, uh, 86. Uh, it was the it was the same year that I started my role, but I uh, at the first uh, one and a half or two years when we had some letters from him and uh, we knew for sure uh, that he was alive and and uh, we, we knew when he sent letters and pictures, uh, and at that time I was I was not enough involved in the, in his uh, in his case because everybody thought he will come back and no need for for everybody to be involved. Afterwards, when he didn't come back uh, and uh, we, we didn't know about his whereabouts, I, I started to deal with him and I met the family. And at that time, his mother, Batya, uh, late, late Batya, she was alive at that time. And uh, his wife, Tammy, and his daughter, Yuval, and the brothers, uh, Hen and uh, Dudu. And uh, we became part of this family because, you know, uh, it was a... It was a, a, a case that uh, a case that uh, caught caught the, the attention of, of everybody because uh, there were sign of life from him from him until the end of uh, I believe of eighty eight and then everything was uh, you know disappearing no 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 signs and nothing and from my point of view even no signs of uh, uh, God forbid that he's not alive because I. I don't, I don't, I don't know nothing about his fate, not right. for good and not for bad. Right. And uh, from that time, uh, you know, I, I started all, also with this family, like other families of Sultan Yaakov, Fink and Al Sheikh, and uh, many other families. And uh, uh, you know, we became we became part of this family and other families. You know, we visited them from time to time. Sometimes every day. Uh, Batya uh, used to work uh, quite near to my uh, to my former uh, house in Fasaba. So every day when I was in Israel and I, I went to work, I was jumping to, for, for 10 minutes for her and we talked privately. She, she was very uh, discreet with me. I was with her and uh, I believe that uh, what happened to me and with the families is that I, I became from one side, part of the families, and from the other side, they allowed me uh, not to be too much close in order to uh, to to uh, to harm my mission. Because you know, when you go to a mission, when you you go abroad to negotiation, you know, when you go abroad to to find some whereabouts, uh, sometimes the clash between the, the 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 your relations with the family. And the fact that you you are going with Mossad, with Shabak, and you have to you you have to be part of them, so it's it's a bit it's a bit of confusion, which I can tell you I was I know that I was a bit criticized that uh, that I dealt with these two uh, kind of uh, of uh, of way of lives. Uh, perhaps they were right, but I think they were not because I can tell you that as a lawyer, I knew always how to make a, a, a difference. How to make a curtain between my personal life and between my profession, between my thoughts, between my 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 feelings? I believe that a lawyer, a professional lawyer, uh, like like a physician who is operating his enemy, uh, at that time he is a specialist. At that time he forget all his uh, hates and, and and loves and everything. So I believe that I uh, I practice this uh, part of my life, my professional life, my personal life in that mission. And I knew how to differ. You know, sometimes I, I, I went home and I wanted to, you know, to, to blow everything 
but it was between me and, and Tommy and between me and myself. Right. But with the families, I, I kept all the rules. You know, um, one of the things, th this is exactly what comes out of reading this book, is the understanding that your commitment to these families, and I, by the way, agree with you, goes far beyond the bureaucratic and the authoritative element of negotiator, but rather truly, if I want to say, a governmental or a state father, where the families would reach out to you, Ori, with sometimes mundane daily requests of needing to deal with the local municipality or having some other difficulty. And you, Ori, you have always been there for them. Yes, I, I, I can tell you that uh, there is a big argue about this uh, kind of, uh, of, uh, of uh, a function uh, because, you know, you can split it. You can have, uh, you can have uh, human beings who are dealing with the family, you know, emotions and small practical things, and you have the uh, intelligence and negotiators uh, and to split and, and to have, a, 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 you know, a big, a big curtain uh, between them. So I was a big exceptional. And I can tell you that, uh, that I, I knew it. I knew it. And from time to time, I heard from people, uh, uh, you know, some critici criticism about it. But um, when, they, when they saw how I'm, uh, I'm acting, you know, they minimized it. Yeah, well, in, but in, I can tell you, you what, what was the, the main thing that, that, uh, that drove me. The main thing that drove me was, uh, was not the acts, but the, the, the phrase uncertainty. The phrase uncertainty in our life is, I think, is the worst thing in our life. It's much worse than a, a, a bad certain. Right. A bad certainty, a bad certainty can be more comfortable than an uncertainty. uncertainty for life. Right. Yeah. And uh, this what drove me to deal with these people because to, to wait for your brother, for your husband, for your son, for 10 years or 15 years or 20 years, uh, whatever, and uh, you know, your imagination is working and you are dreaming and it loses whatever you, you know, I can give you a lecture of, of, of a week about Ori, we, we Our kid goes away for a couple of hours. We're not sure where they are. We're already All freaking right. out. So can you imagine, can you imagine that? And this uncertainty was the base for my behavior. Because, uh, you know, I, sometimes I came to one of the mothers or, or, or wife or, or some relative, and they told me about their fantasies, about their dreams, about, uh, about things which are not, not, not used to be uh, among people who are treating such, uh, such cases. And, um, you know, uh, Moliere, the French, uh, the French poet, right. said once that the uncertainty is much worse than the worst certainty on earth. Right. And this what drove me and this what drives me in, in, in this mission. And I, I try to, to describe it in, uh, in my book. And uh, I believe that... Uh, and you do. It really, it really comes across. And what you're showing us is the ability to conduct this on such a high level, Ori, of humanity and compassion. Compassion reeks off of your deeds and off of your book and truly listening to you but also looking at you through the eyes of a knock at the door is your personality. Um, and, and go touching upon that for a minute, I want to go a little bit personal and ask you about Tami. Uh, throughout oh. the book she's there accompanying you, holding your hand, skipping you know a trip in the Far East um, and coming back home because Gilad Shalit was on his way home. Um, talk to me a little bit about your relationship and how it played a role in your official capacity in this, in this world, in this realm. Uh, first of all, it's, it's a role not in my mission and not in any part of my life, but uh, uh, in my whole life. Okay. We are together, we are together for uh, above 55 years. And we uh, we had uh, so many years uh, and, and events together. Um, she, I believe that she is the best part of my personality. Right. And uh, I think that without her, I couldn't I couldn't achieve anything in my life, and I couldn't do this mission, which is a mission that she has nothing to do practically and formally with it. But for example, I I think that most of my visiting at the family's house. Uh, Tammy, she, she, she was with, with me. Right. You know, first of all, uh, you know, I admit 
that uh, ladies and women uh, has some something else than we have. Right. But he, he in the, she, Tammy in, the, in, in a very specific uh, way, I think she's, uh, she's the one human being in my life that uh, I believe that uh, she's part of this mission. And uh, I was not ashamed to write it in my book. You know, some people said, hey, what, what are you writing so much? You know, it's, uh, you know, some people said, it's me, it's myself. Look, no, it's Tammy and me. And I'm so proud to, I'm so proud to, to shout it. It's so, the opposite, Ori. I believe it's the opposite. Because again, what makes your book and your mission so special is exactly this. Your humanity, which in my view increases the authenticity and the connection between the families to you and your ability to perform the mission. And truly, I can tell you on a personal level, having read your wonderful book, I truly admire you for it. It really stands out, your role and her role, not just as government envoys, but as human beings. Um, thank, you. thank you very much, but let me deny all your uh, accusations. <laughs> <laughs> I want to I wanna, uh, ask you um, a, p a semi-political question. You were able to perform your tasks under various um, you know, defense ministers from a variety of political shades and colors. Did that affect at all um, your mission, the, the politics of it in Israel? Never, never for a moment. Never, never for a moment. I can tell you that uh, this uh, very specific mission, uh, as I described it to you now in, in, in the few moments that we are together, but uh, especially in, the, in my book, uh, it's above everything. It's above everything. It's like, uh, it's like you know, like, uh, like you're standing in, uh, in a synagogue or in a church, whatever, and, and you, you, you feel like you are, you are with the, you're together with the holy things in your life. Right. Uh, I, 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 can, I can tell you I was with the right, right wing defense minister, left wing center. Right, right. Uh, I cannot say, and uh, I'm not, uh, I'm not a, a polite person at that, uh, at that moment. Uh, nobody, nobody was influenced by his political view or political position in that, in that matter. And no, nor do I believe you would let any politics get in the way of this and anybody who reads the book and you don't have to comment can read about your diplomatic political politeness skills in your interactions with the united nations in lebanon but that yeah. will remain for our viewers to read in the book i i want to touch upon something a bit more current and ask you israel has traded in the past in exchange for prisoners of war um, in a way that seems by others as extremely controversial. It became controversial to exchange, let's say, 1,027 prisoners in exchange for Gilad Shalit. Some people criticize it for being too much. What's your position on this, uh, on this matter? Uh, I, I feel free not to be part of it. Uh, as I told you, first of all, uh, as, I, uh, as I cited before, uh, the case of Samir Assad was uh, such a consideration that right. everybody, I believe that most of the people who are, who are nowadays dealing with it forgot it, and it was. Right. And number, number two, I have to tell you something which uh, has nothing to do with your question, but it is, the, it is an answer. Uh, the state of Israel is one of the few states on earth that uh, few that has uh, uh, three three uh, ways of uh, compulsory service. The state of Israel uh, has a men compulsory service. Number one, number two, women compulsory, right. and number three, the reserved, which people are are, are are serving their country sometimes until the age of uh, 45, 50, and the country is sending them sometimes sometimes to fight, sometimes to fight. To fight means to be injured or to be, uh, God forbid, killed, right. to be uh, kidnapped or to be a prisoner of war or to be missed. So if the country is sending us, the country has to bring us back. And for me, I'm, I'm putting aside all the other uh, elements, all the other elements. And I know that, that people are criticizing from time to time the freeing, uh, the freeing of terrorists. And they are right. They are right. But I believe that terrorists should be fought as you fight terrorists in the battlefield. And afterwards, all the rest, I, I in person, I'm not dealing with that because if I would enter into any politics or any um, uh, public argue, 
I I had to leave to leave my role. Right, you will have hurt your mission. Understood, Ori. Um, understood. Um, yeah. I wanted to ask you also about the technicalities. The issue of prisoners of war and missions in action, and in the global language, refers many a time to state actors. Right? Israel had to deal with Egypt, Syria, and others. Now. In your case, you actually had to venture and deal with terrorist organizations like Hezbollah. And what's the difference between the two? Like, how has your experience been um, when you're when you're dealing with terrorist organizations as opposed to state actors? Uh, first of all, uh, first of all, in, in, in past times, when uh, when countries were fighting, and uh, at the end of uh, at the end of wars, they were exchange of prisoners of war. First of all, there were treaties, there are treaties, you know, right. the Geneva Treaty, right. all the treaties, right. and, and things are, were being were handled more organized, more not more legal, but more organized. And, you know, uh, exchanging of prisoners, prisoners of war after a war means that you are freeing people who the day before wanted to kill you. It's the same like uh, freeing the terrorists, the same. Right. Right. Now, I, I'm not coming, I, I'm not entering into, you know, the philosophy of this thing. Uh, at a certain stage in the 80s and uh, beginning of the 90s, uh, wars and conflicts became more be, 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 uh, among uh, not countries. I'm not talking about the, this present war in right. Ukraine and in Russia, right. but, uh, but mostly between uh, organizations and, and states and countries, which is, uh, I believe, an unbalanced, uh, unbalanced way of thinking right. in their life, even in the cruel and bad things. So, you know... Um, an organization has less uh, rules than a state, than right. uh, you know, democratic state or even even a, a monarch, a monarch state. So it's like a battle. Uh, like I, I wrote in my book that my grandfather gave me once an example that uh, the world champion, the, the world boxer champion, came into the arena, and in front of him will come a kid of, of eleven, of twelve, with a broken bottle of, of glass. He asked me who will win. I said, the, you know, the, the, the champion. He said, no, you're not right. The boy with the, with the with bottle will hurt him, you know, below the belt, and he will, he, will, he will hurt him and he will win. So this is the whole story. You know, it's an unbalanced uh, uh, thing. Right. I believe that, I believe you can talk with everybody. I, be, I believe you can talk with the terrorists uh, if it comes to humanity, humanitarian things, talk with everybody the um, lawyer's mindset. Ori, before we go, I have to touch upon this. Uh, you have been working, spearheading Variety Israel, working with children with special needs, chairing this organization up until recently. Um, we got to know a little bit of your personality, but tell us a little bit about what attracted you to Variety and what was uh, your feeling towards the kids and your role there? Um, I, was, uh, I was nominated to be uh, um, a head of Variety Israel uh, in the 90s and uh, it, it was the same accident that they asked me to come for a year and I stayed for 30 years you know this is the, the, the name of my life <laughs> by chance uh, by chance yeah, yeah by chance. <laughs> and uh, and after after a couple of years I was also elected to uh, to uh, to be the international president of variety worldwide right with, that's true with the uh, 80s countries worldwide this organization is uh, an organization that was established in the U.S. in Pittsburgh in 1928, I believe, right. uh, by the show business people. And uh, uh, it is a worldwide one, and the Israeli one is a very strong one. We are helping disadvantaged kids uh, from all kinds of uh, disadvantages, uh, all kinds of, uh, of uh, religious, all kinds of nationalities, all kinds of colors. No matter if he's Jew, Muslim, Christian, Black, White, whatever, and uh, we are dealing with thousands of kids in Israel, and uh, we have uh, a center in Jerusalem, which is gathering uh, Arab, Israeli, Druze, Cherkess, religious, non-religious kids wow. who are just uh, you know special kids. So this is uh, the other mission of my life, and I'm so proud to proud and. Uh, and, you know, thanks God that he gave me the chances to, to be in these two parts of, uh, of helping others.
Right. You know, just um, listening to you and reading your book and seeing all that you've done, both, you know, successfully as a, as a practicing lawyer and then in addition, all of your different roles, working with the government, working with security services, doing the work with Variety, quite outstanding. I say we're very thankful and Israeli society should be very thankful for having you in this capacity and role. And I, for one, Ori, can see that connection in the humanity of it between taking care of the families of those POWs and MIAs and taking care of those kids with special needs and being able to have a heart towards those who are in true need within Israeli society. And kudos for your incredible work in this regard. Truly impressive. I, I, you know, I, uh, I think something we are a bit different than you. I think that I'm the lucky person that was privileged to deal with these things. And uh, I see myself as, uh, as one who, who, who got this chance. And uh, I'm uh, not, not because I'm, I'm trying to, you know, to, to, to play the modest, no. but I think that it's a, it's a great gift for your life to deal with these uh, issues. You know, Ori, I, I believe you and I'm um, very excited. I could go on and talk to you for hours about your experience and the book. And I have to tell our viewers, I found your book to be one of the most fascinating ones I've read in the recent times. And to understand Israel and to understand its history, you, ha you have an opportunity here to live it through the eyes of Ori Slonim. Ori, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Shachar. And uh, I hope that all our missing in action and prisoners of war will come back and soon to the families, to Israel. And uh, thank you. Amen, amen. I could again talk to you for hours, but we're out of time. I'd like to thank you for joining me and most of all for your service for Israel and the families of those who went missing or taken in, as prisoners of war. It's been a true inspiration, Ori, to listen to your story, which is the quint essential story of Israel. To follow Ori's unique life story and fascinating journey, I highly recommend all of you read his book, A Knock at the Door. This truly gives you the sense of the heart of the nation of Israel through the eyes of Ori Slonim. I'd like to thank all of you for watching and see you next time as we cast another fascinating eye on Israel. Thank you all for watching. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double chai, or more. Simply visit the JBS website at jbstv.org and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check to JBS, Post Office Box 360, Stamford, Connecticut 06904. Or you can call the JBS pledge line at 833-MY-JBS-TV. That's 833-695-2788. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. We thank you for your kind support.